Good afternoon and welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. We're in the Apollo Gallery. I'm Mark Marquette and our guest today is John Tribe. Welcome, John. Thank you, Mark. John, you could call him a NASA legend, though he worked for Rockwell. And he is, is one interesting gentleman that has a great history that he loves to share. And he's a man who's lived the triumph and tragedies of America's great space program. And we'll get into him for just a minute. But first, we want to uh, say we're very COVID conscious. We've, John and I have got masks on that we're going to take off now because between us, we have a plexiglass barrier here, courtesy of Coastal uh, uh, Clay, Clay Lock here in Titusville, a coastal window and tent. Right there, Marty donated this plexiglass when Karen Conklin, our executive director, called him up and asked uh, what they would cost to make uh, something for us here. Uh, they happily donated it to us. So Clay, thank you. For, and uh, his uh, coastal window and tent is on Hopkins Street here in Titusville. And they're Titusville natives and supporters of everything Titusville. So we thank Clay Locke for donating this to us because this is so exciting how Stay Curious program has taken off, not only embraced by you, uh, our, our listeners out there, uh, born in the COVID crisis. This is our way of outreach to you uh, with our beautiful nonprofit. And by bringing you guests like John Tribe, and it's caught on. We've got a bunch of people now wanting to be on this, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, Mr. Jay Honeycutt. Hello to you. Uh, he was going to be watching today and said he'd like to be on the show. And uh, John Tribe was telling me before that Jay Honeycutt, him, and Lee Solid trade puzzles to keep your mind alert and busy. Yep. Right, John? Do something. Got to do something. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, well, if I see a good puzzle for you, I'll let you guys know there. We'll talk okay. more about that. And also, hi to Dr. Al Kohler. I know you're watching. So we've got a lot of, lot of people that buzz in on this program. And uh, if, tell your friends because it's on our history, uh, on our Facebook page. And actually, I thank Facebook that they have provided this vehicle because like many of the nonprofits uh, around our country, we have found this as a way to outreach and be in touch with you people that love our museum, you love space, you want to support us, but we can't let you in the doors yet. And we're working on that hopefully beginning of September as uh, the numbers are coming down in Florida. But as you've seen, they've canceled conference football seasons and stuff like that across the country. So we've got to be very careful and get our country back to health. So while we're doing that, we're bringing you great programs like with Mr. John Tribe here. And uh, uh, John, I'm going to have you uh, tell us a little bit about how you first got introduced to explosive rockets. Explosive rockets? Well, the, uh, my first experience, of course, was I grew up during the war in, uh, in England and we, uh, we were evacuated initially and, uh, and then when my father was torpedoed and, uh, and, and survived and brought home, we were finished up back in Portsmouth, our hometown which was the, uh, a prime target for the, uh, for the Nazis. And uh, we were bombed pretty heavily, so I grew up nightly. Wow. Getting, uh, you know, being dragged down to the shelter and listening to stuff falling all around me as we walked, ran down the street. And I always remember, I, 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 I remember now that I worried because my mother had little steel pieces on her shoes, you know, to ah. protect the leather. Oh, okay. And we were running down the road, and, the, and the, then we had a battery of rockets that were firing just around the back of the back of the house. Wow! And the noise of her those shoes on the road really bothered me. I said, you know, the Germans are going to hear us. They're going to hear us huh. because there's stuff falling. There's you know shrapnel and things falling. And we, my grandmother had a shelter farther down the road, and we would wow. go there for, for the, you know, and spend the night in this shelter, which was half buried in the backyard. Wow. It was covered in dandelions and I could be, I, and uh, marigolds. Uh -huh. and, I, and I can, if I smell marigolds now, it just flash. I have a flashback. Oh, really? Really? It's yeah. Really weird. Well, but anyway, uh, luckily, after my father was based at, uh, on shore after the torpedo incident, so uh, and he had to go up to Glasgow for uh, to work with Baron Strouds on on range finders for the Navy. Mm -hmm. And we went, he, my mother and he and I went up there, and while we were up there in 1944, a B-1 hit the street. 
Mm. V1 was, of course, the first of the Nazi vengeance weapons. Right, yes. And my sister, who was going to high school, was still there, and she was in that shelter. It was just four houses from where it hit. And that shelter moved six inches in the ground. Wow. But you know, that was my first, you know, we rushed back from Scotland. In 1941? 1944. 1944. July 44. of 44. So flash forward, our, our Stay Curious fans out there, to 25 years later, and you're seeing the architect of these V-2 bombs, Werner von Braun, launch the Saturn V rocket to the moon. Well, before that, it went and, back on when I was working the Atlas program. But, but, but I'm just saying, but yeah. what, what a contrast. I, 25 I, years later, here you are part of the, of the space program with uh, von Braun, who did that, uh, almost killing your family. I, I, back sat, in the day. I sat next to him on the Mariner 2 launch. Oh, did you? We, we, fl we flew Mariner from uh, Complex 12 in uh, August of 62. And he came down for the launch. An unmanned spacecraft that went to Venus? Yep. yep. The uh, first, first uh, spacecraft to make it to Venus and, right. and get data back. Okay. But, uh, so he and I sat as close as you and I are right now. Right. We never exchanged a word. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, because, you know, I was a grunt and he was a, you know, an icon even yeah. in those days. He was yeah. a national figure. So, you know, I didn't initiate conversation with him. Well, John Tribe is truly an English gentleman. He's been a friend of our museum for many years. John, you're always giving your time uh, the, the last several decades to uh, places that want to hear pe speakers talk and so forth. And uh, many of you can see John on some of the documentaries of the Apollo 11 50th anniversary. Uh, you and uh, our, our board chairman, Charlie Mars, and Lee Solid out there, the rocket guy, you guys were just eat up last year with interviews and so forth yeah. on there. So uh, uh, you're kind of a lonely guy doing your puzzles now and <laughs> out, well, out of the limelight. Uh, it's a big contrast is what I'm saying, John. It right? is. We, I miss being, you know, I was a, I've been a docent for the last 23 years. So, you know, I was always actively involved with, uh, with events out here. So I still felt like I was part of the space program and, and I've missed that. Six, six months, you know, we've been basically, uh, you know, isolated from well, the base. Well, like us too, we miss our, our guys sitting over there at the docent desk on Thursdays. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Dick and Murphy and, and uh, just, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a, a hangout for, to, to some people like you. And, yeah, yeah it's been hard, and, and we're glad that you're, you're there. I was saying that he's doing uh, puzzles with Mr. Uh, Jay Honeycutt. Uh, who are happy that he wants to be on our program. Mr. Honeycutt was KSC director for two years, and I looked him up a little bit ago, and he had, John, he had 16 launches during his tenure, mm. shuttle launches yep. out there. So I can't wait to have Mr. Honeycutt on here and talk about that. Well, he's, he's got a very I, interesting background when you go back to Houston, too, when he worked there. Yes, I understand he was involved with Apollo 13. He, uh, he was uh, the sim, the, what they call the sim supervisor. Sim there, supervisor, okay. Yeah, which was a very important yeah. role in, in, in training the astronauts. For well, we're, we're, look, they, we're going to look forward to talking to Mr. Honeycutt here in the near future as, we have, as we're getting looking forward to hearing more about your career. So... Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, landing here at Kennedy Space Center in the early days and chasing armadillos out of those hot trailers. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I wanted to fly in the Royal Air Force. That was always my goal. Okay. You know, from, and uh, uh -huh. at grammar school, I was all set to go to the Air Force Academy. I failed the medical. Oh, really? Th this was in 1954. Flat feet or something? No, ears. Uh, oh, I, had okay. a, I had a... I, Unfortunately, took the medical while I was, uh, I had a bit of a cold and I had blocked eustachian tubes and the Air Force doctor flunked me huh. and they would not really look at it. And I was, you know, I was, my whole career goals would just fell down the pipe right there and then. So uh, I figured, uh, you know, I'd start, I'd already got my flying license and I thought, well, how do I keep flying? And I thought, well, de Havilland's, the Havilland Aircraft Company mm -hmm. has a flying program where they, sub they subsidize the flying. I'll go work for them. You know, it was that sort of decision. And they said, well, why don't you go down to Christchurch and take an apprenticeship, a five-year apprenticeship? So I said, okay, I'll do that. You know, this was, this was when you're 18 years old, you make all these flash decisions, but they yeah. were really turning points. So I went to de Havilland's and I was there for five years, but in 1957, in the middle of my apprenticeship, I get to see the Sputnik fly over. Ah. And I'm thinking, oh, that's, boy, that's a whole new world starting up. And at the same time, the de Havilland company began to build a large rocket called the Blue Streak, 
which was based on the atlas over here. And uh, I decided I wanted to work on the blue streak. So in 1959, I switched from aircraft to rockets. And in 1960, they canceled the program over there. Mm -hmm. And here I am now with no, no rocket future. So I think, well, the only place I'm going to get any future is on the other side of the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. So the I wrote, wrote to Convair Astronautics, because it was then, and I said, can you guys use me? You know, I've got five years experience, I've got a degree, and, uh, and a guy called B.G. McNabb, who was the base manager of Convair, and at about the same time Convair became General Dynamics. Okay, yes. But he wrote back to me and he said, absolutely, you, get, you get, make your way over here. You know, they weren't going to pay my way over. You, you get over here and we'll have a job for you. So in 1961, I arrived in Cocoa Beach with one dollar in my pocket. One dollar in your pocket. Wow. And uh, immediately found that if you didn't have a car, you couldn't get anywhere in, <laughs> in Cocoa Beach. So, uh, so Mr. Mack took me down to the Cocoa Beach State Bank, and he, uh, he said, I want this guy to have $2,000 loan. He's got no, no background whatsoever. In 1961, I'll, a $2,000 loan, that's like $20,000 Well, today. that was enough to buy a little car and pay for my wife to come over. I'd been married six months at the time. I'd left mm -hmm. her in England. And, uh, and I started at, at Convair on, or General Dynamics on the Atlas program. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went, uh, it, it took me six months to get cleared before they would let me out on the Cape. Hmm. I was working at Patrick before that. And anyway, I went out to the Cape and threw me right into the, into the briar patch. Literally, you're a propulsion engineer, go check out that rocket. Hmm. And, uh, and with the help of a whole was bunch that of- Was that an Atlas rocket yep, on Atlas, 39? That was, no, it was on 12. And, uh -huh. uh, we were at that time. We were doing the Ranger program to the Moon, Mariner program to Venus, hmm. uh, and we switched back and forth between sites. So I did some Mercury time too on 14. Uh, and you know the way you learn back in those days was you just relied on the technicians to basically coach you, help you. You know you do your own investigation, but you relied a lot on on the techs and the quality people that really knew their stuff to help you. And you, were, and, you, and you worked as a team, and it was a great, great job. So anyway, that got me into the rocket business. I went back to England in 1964 for one year, because I was only going to come over here for two years originally. I stayed almost four. Uh, got back in England, and things were not much better than they were when I left in 1960. So I <laughs> turned around and came back again. Mm -hmm. This time, Convair General Dynamics was uh, starting to phase down, and they were getting towards the end of the Atlas military program. Mm -hmm. So uh, they gave my stuff to uh, North American Aviation on the Apollo program. Said, "Can you use this guy?" Absolutely. You know, they were hurting for people back then. So it went over to, to Apollo, and uh, again, it was just which like is North American Rockwell, which was North, which Rockwell. became North American Aviation, became North American Rockwell, became Rockwell International, became Boeing. Yes. Over yes. a period of about uh, thirty-five years. You guys have years. taught me that it's hard to follow the all of the contractors that mm -hmm. work for NASA. It's sometimes. the same same company. All the way through. Yeah. We just kept changing names. Well, I was kidding you about the early days at, at the uh, Cape Canaveral uh, because of the green General Dynamics hard hats. And, oh, uh, yeah, the armadillos. Uh, there's, there's an excellent, uh, NASA's done a good job with oral histories. And, John, your oral history is on there uh, from 2011. Uh, and I, was, I wrote down the, the lady that interviewed you guys. I, uh, Sandra Johnson mm -hmm. interviewed you, uh, a lot of you. Back then, and I, I read that to do my homework. And uh, uh, he's tell us what you did to some of the armadillos that we're crawling in there. <laughs> well, we you know, that, now, Pete is not going to get you in trouble here. We're past the statute of limitations. <laughs> but what uh, back then, you know, we the uh, the office that we had out on the pads was an unair conditioned ready room, uh, which was a you know, it was built to be blown over because it was very close to the to the launch site. Built to be blown over by the rocket blast. Well, not okay. intentionally, but oh, I mean, okay. if, if, but, but you know, <laughs> if we had one blow on the pad, it was uh, expendable. Okay. But it was so it was not a it was a pretty utility building. But anyway, it uh, it was not air conditioned, so we sit there during the day, you know, and sweat with the doors open, and the armadillos, which were all around us out there, would would come into the into the office area and get inside. And then, you know, when we closed up at night to go home, uh, they would get under the, the lockers that we had down one side. Hmm. And, uh, and, ja and they'd push down with their feet, and they'd actually jam themselves under those lockers. You could not get them out. Wow. And, uh, you know, you'd push at them with a broom, and you could not budge them. So you had to tilt the whole locker over. Oh, my. So then we, we 
grab the armadillo and we'd give it to the techs who had a, had their own offices down at the pad itself. And they would spray those armadillos green <laughs> and put a big General Dynamics logo on each side <laughs> and let them go. And you'd look out there and you'd see these hard hats all disappearing across <laughs> the boondocks. But uh, I'm sure that, you know, the, the animal control people would have a fit now. If they oh, that. yes, but, they would. That's but, a, uh, a different world back then. Well, that, that's a great story. Thanks for sharing <laughs> that. It wasn't all, all serious rocket formulas and no, stuff it back was, in those uh, days. There, there was a lot of fun out there in those days, especially on the, on the pads. And, well, uh, well, let's get over here. Uh, uh, you, you, when I, you've been involved in a lot of the seminal moments of the uh, America's Space Program. You were, uh, as I recall, you had headsets on during the fatal Apollo 1 fire. You were involved with yeah. that, correct? Yeah, and I was on, on station uh, that night, which was probably one of the traumatic events of my life. Yes. For obvious reasons that, you know, we, uh, I, I just run, got through running a, a simulated static fire with Gus Grissom and, and Skip Chauvin. Mm -hmm. And the comm was, uh, comm was really bad. Skip was ticked off. He was, he'd been grouchy all day and he'd got grouchy as the evening wore on. And uh, because it was, the test was way over time. And uh, the, Skip said, hey, let's just uh, take a 10 minute break here and, uh, and, and see if we can get this comm cleaned up. Mm -hmm. and the communications uh, line was, yeah, the was very bad. Communications Gus Grissom bad. had said, how are we going to go to the moon if we can't talk between two yeah, buildings? Yeah, I remember that very well. Yeah. yeah. And uh, You were on the headset when he was saying that. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And so anyway, we, we, uh, we, sat, we sat back and I started to write what we call a test prep sheet, which was a procedure to run the next day. And all of a sudden I hear fire. And I looked up and, uh, and Dave Stewart was uh, sitting next to me on the stabilization and control panel and I said, did he say fire? And then, and then another statement came over quickly, uh, fire in the, I think it was fire in the cockpit. And then uh, almost like a scream, get us out of here, we're burning up. And, uh, and I said, oh my God, you know, this, this sounds awful. I jumped up and uh, we have one phone in the, this, we, we ran all the uh, spacecraft testing from the ACE station in the MSOB. Yeah. Not in the, uh, in the firing room like everybody thought. All the spacecraft people were back in the, in what is now the operations and control building. But there was one phone we had there in that control room and I grabbed it and I called my wife and I said, uh, we've, got an we've had an accident out here, I'm fine, don't worry about me, but I'm gonna be late. And I hung up and immediately uh, Dave Stewart said, let me have it and he took it and he said, it's dead. The phone lines were all cut. Hmm. And we still haven't heard anything back from the pad. There's no feedback at all from anybody up on the upper structure and then suddenly Don Babbitt, the pad leader, came back and uh, and Skip said, "What's the status, Don?" And he said, "I can't begin to describe." Uh, Remember that, and uh, you know that was, of course, that lived with us for the rest of the. Of program. course, a horrible tragedy: the loss of the Apollo One astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. And you know, we do a memorial here every year for the three mm -hmm. tragedies, and I think you've been to it, but. On January 27th this year, before the COVID, I'm in the building, and Lowell Grissom shows up, Gus mm -hmm. Grissom's brother. I know. They spit an image of each other, and and this is the, the anniversary of his, his brother's death, and he's got a cool T-shirt on that said Gus Mobile, oh, the old yeah. cartoon with <laughs> Gus Mobile on there. It was just a happy gentleman. He lives in St. Louis. I'd met him before Lowell Grissom, and... And uh, we've got Gus Grissom's flight suit that he wore in Gemini 4 in our, our, our Gemini gallery. And I took a picture of him beside there. But I, I just said, this is your brother's you know, anniversary of, of you know, a bad day in your life. Yep. And he says, yeah, but it's all, it, it's, you know, it all th bad things turn into good, Lowell, yeah, Lowell that's... said. And, and still to this day, we remember those, those guys. Uh, did you think uh, that would have been maybe the, the crew to be first on the moon? Uh, certainly possible, you know, so you, you can't say indefinitely at this point of time. But Gus Grissom was pretty driven to be. Uh, he was. He was, uh, you know, he'd, he'd been uh, one of the very first Mercury and, uh, mm -hmm. and the uh, first Gemini and, in, and the first Apollo. So, you know, it's quite probable that he could have been the first on the moon. But who knows? Yeah, who knows? Well, but, here's, the, here's the command module. I want to, this gentleman here is an expert on maneuvering a spacecraft in outer space. And you had to figure out how to do that. And you look around the little, little, little sides of the spacecraft here. And each corner here has got four little jets on it that they call reaction control system. 
And that was your expertise, right? With the hypergolic right. fuels, they call it. So let's talk a little bit about your wheelhouse there as an engineer and how important that was and, uh, and how that translated into the, your uh, work on the shuttles systems. Okay, well, when I, when I came back from England in, uh, in 65 and, and started work with North America, and the first job they gave me were, was one of these quads. You see, that the, there's four reaction control system quads. That's quads, what they're called. Okay. It's one, uh -huh. one on each quadrant, 90 degrees apart. And they provide the roll, yaw, and, uh, and, and uh, pitch for the, the whole stack. Mm -hmm. During the uh, uh, flight from the moon, around the moon, during the mating, demating, and back, and then of course with the lunar module. With the, with the and, lunar and module. I haven't shouted out to Marty Winkle. You know Marty Gr yep, Grumman yep. guy. We've got the Grumman here, and but they had the same the, the engines. Rockwell guys same here. engines on the lunar module. Yes. Okay. The Marquardt engines, mm -hmm. and they were powered by by uh, the propellants were nitrogen tetroxide and monomethyl hydrazine. Mm -hmm. And they're called hypergolic propellants because they don't need an ignition system. Okay. You put the two propellants together in the, in a little in the thrust chambers, they would ignite. Okay. So you know that was one less thing you had to worry about was ignition. You're right. But the unfortunate thing about propellants, uh, first of all, they're, they're storable, which is excellent for a, for a space mission. Mm -hmm. You don't—they're not cryogenic. You don't have to worry about vacuum jackets, cooling them and stuff like keep, that. keeping right? them cold. Okay. Uh, they, they're storable, but they're very toxic and and in and carcinogenic so you know they were tough stuff to handle and, and when you did any service and operations you always had to wear scape suits and scape stands for self-contained atmospheric protective ensemble right but there are big rubber suits i think you may even have one well in we have one in our in yeah. our in our yeah. uh, new uh, uh, space workers gallery in there we and, do uh, marty was certified to be in one so was i we, uh, we all, you were too yeah, we all have it's just to, a big uh, rubber suit everybody like a like a space suit in a way but it's just but, it's all it, rubber it and, had a, and, a, and air a big pack window on the back. for your for your head and you had a backpack for your air huh? but it was uh, it was a miserable suit and uh, <laughs> you know Hot the texan seen. quality all had to wear them of course and they made all us engineers go through training and wear them and uh, and we in fact went through cycled through uh, being on station during the actual operations so we had we knew what the techs were going through uh -huh. we could appreciate how uncomfortable it was how much it limited your sight uh, your big rubber gloves it limited what you could feel and touch so it was good that the engineers actually lived through wearing those suits, but we had a, you know, we, you'd start off, you'd go out to the, to the pad and they'd put you in long johns to start with. Yeah, okay. And then, then they would tape up your wrists and your ankles. Ah. And, uh, and then you'd put on this suit over, the, over your long johns and you'd have a big old backpack on your back and you'd lift the helmet up over your head and the tech would turn the backpack on. And the air was either too cold or not enough. <laughs> and uh, so you're either hot or cold. And one, one guy that worked for me actually had a line break and sprayed liquid air onto him and actually burned him. Mm. So, you know, it was, it was a little bit hazardous wearing these suits. And you'd, they'd haul you out there in a trailer and you'd, you'd go up in the elevator and you'd huff and puff and work your way around the different, you know, hardware. Wow. But it was, uh, it, you know, when you, when you bent down to pick anything up, your suit would... Be, relieve pressure and then right so th they were not comfortable but that was that was the joy of hypergolics you know you got got used the to the joy it. of hypergolics these and, were uh, some nasty stuff we talked to some of the lunar module guys that said just an eyedropper of it would go through your hand and and they they had uh, uh you know some spills that minor spills that well, we, did we had damage. I worked with a guy, and Marty knows him, of course, Horace Lambeth. You know, Horace and I were, Horace was the, the, my, the, my NASA equivalent. Okay. Through our, my, almost our whole career. And I, okay. I, I dearly loved the guy. We worked together well. A quality guy? No, he was, an, he was like chief okay. engineer for uh, Lockheed at the end. Uh, but when he passed away, I, I, uh, I talked about, not about what he and I had achieved over our, our career, but the events that, that had not been very stellar. Uh -huh. And working with hypers, you have a lot of those. You accumulate them over the years. You know, you have liquid separators that blow up. You have toxic releases that gas gardeners. Uh, we have propellant, we had helium tanks that blew up under tests. You know, and we had a, a tanker that we were blowing down the MIS, the mobile service structure on 39, blowing it down into a tanker. Hmm. And the contractor substituted a 10 PSI tanker for a 50 PSI tanker, and we blew the whole end off the tanker. Whoa! Almost killed the driver, you know, and I, and and the more I 
started talking about these, the more came to mind. And, and poor old Horace, you know, he's having a fit. It was, it, this wasn't his funeral. This was uh, his retirement. Okay, his retirement. He, he says, I just, uh, I'd forgotten <laughs> about all these. But, uh, you know, we, 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 we did have a lot of events. And, and like, every, like Elon Musk says, you know, every time you have an accident like that or a failure, you learn. And, and we did. You know, we, we learned from day one that, you know, we, we better get serious about hypers. On, uh, on Apollo 7, we were doing a loading test before the actual flight. Mm -hmm. We had a test vehicle out there on 34, and we were loading oxidizer. And uh, we had a, a, a very complicated disconnect that, that connected to the vehicle. And it would tend to get plugged up. And anyway, uh, we were trying to pull a vacuum on a command module tank to get ready to load it. And, uh, and all the oxidizer had not been drained out. And as the guy cranked the vacuum pump up, he actually sucked the oxidizer back out of the tank into the vacuum pump. And, and when it got into the, into the oil tank, it just sprayed out through the vent hole. So he had this big red stream of oxidizer coming up out of his, out of his vacuum pump. Well, the standard procedure back then in, 19, in early 67 was hose it down. So he's, he, he put his thumb over the oxidizer and then take it off and he said, it's not stopping. So uh, the engineer on station uh, said, well, you better hose it off. So he started hosing his oxidizer off the top of the pad 34, which turned, you know, a fairly small oxidizer fill into 400 gallons of nitric acid. Oh, wow. That he ran all down the side of the S1B one, one out on the pad. Wow. And, uh, and I got a call and I, I, it was a Sunday morning. I remember I went rushing out there and got to meet Norm Carlson for the first time. Okay. Norm was outside the blockhouse there. I got out of the car, he came stomping over to me and he said, what the hell are you doing to my rocket? <laughs> <laughs> Is that what he said? Uh, but, but that was, uh, and, but from that incident, and Ted Sassine wrote up a little story about this, but you know, all the corrective actions that we took to make sure we never did that again on the vehicle uh, came into play. You know, how we scuppered the mm -hmm. disconnects, how we protected all the facility, protected the rocket, and uh, a lot of the corrective actions we would always have after that aspirator so we could suck up spills. Mm -hmm. uh, a, lo a lot of uh, fallout came from that one little spill. You know, uh, that comes to mind that uh, 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 Bob Seek, uh, who we t I talked to the other day, and, you mm -hmm. know, is a friend of our museum, an mm -hmm. outgoing treasure. Uh, we, we were talking about the, uh, something you're familiar with, the approach and landing tests. Yep out there. Now, were you out there at the approach and landing test? Not, not approach and landing. I went out there on some of the recoveries. Okay. Uh, uh, he was talking, and, and Bob, Bob always said in his early days with Gemini that, uh, that if you made a mistake, uh, you didn't get in trouble. All right. You didn't I get mean, in let, trouble unless you tried to hide it. Unless you tried to hide yeah. it, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and that NASA's attitude was, what did we do to set you up for this failure? Yeah. What, how did we not train it's, you properly yep, that astute. you're doing this? Is mm -hmm. that, and, and that permeates through the whole program, and, doesn't and that's, it? You know, we started off on Apollo with, uh, with the, you know, the overall governing <clears throat> procedure. It was called an APOP. Uh -huh. It was Apollo Pre-Operations Procedures. It was a control document. It was a little document about this thick. By the end of the Apollo program, it was a document about <laughs> this thick. Uh -huh. But everything that we did, and uh, uh, you know, caused a mistake, or we fact we discovered during the life of the Apollo program, caused a change in that procedure, and it was, and it in turn led to the shuttle program. You know, we we learned all the way through this. Well, that was a, that was a comforting way to to to, to work, knowing yep. that, that that you made a mistake, but you're you're making the rules as you go along. Nobody has done this before. Uh, you know, nobody they, built a vehicle like this. Nobody built the lunar module to just fly in space and only space by, by uh, men. But we, had no a, we had a we had a leader before. back back then called Rocco Patron. I don't yes, know if you yes. Heard of Rocco. We got Rocco right up there. Is his picture on the yeah, wall up there? Rocco we had his was uh, over there. He was uh, a very intimidating guy. Well, you he, know he what uh, uh, Ernie Rios told me. His his uh, they called they called Rocco Patron the ACM. From Ernie, you know Ernie Rios, yeah, you yeah, worked I know with Ernie, Ernie out yeah. there on the. Mm -hmm. uh, he said he was the ACM, the ass chewing machine. Yep. He, <laughs> you know, when we had this spill out at 34, was the first time I got to face him. Uh huh. You know, the next morning. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh, <laughs> on, on the Monday, uh, my boss says, "Hey, we need to go down. We're gonna gonna go down and brief Rocco on the, on the spill yesterday." I said, "Okay." So I figured, you know, I had my boss, my boss's boss, and my and about three levels of management about above me, all going with me. 
I said, you know, I'll just sit in the corner and listen. Get down there, and this, this one rocker is sitting there behind this great big desk with one chair sitting in front of him, and then all the rest are around the outside of the room. Oh. And I get guided into the one chair. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. And, uh, and, and Rocco was, uh, he was, he was scary. But if you told him the facts, you told him if you screwed up, how you screwed up, and what you're going to do to make sure that doesn't happen again, he, was, he respected you. If you try to snow him, you were lost. Yeah, there's several stories. He fired a couple of junior engineers on yeah, the spot because they were trying to BS him. And, but the and funny he, thing he was, said, that no, was, I, I want to hear. That's the know. first time I met him, and yet uh, I stayed uh, in touch with him right through until he died. Oh, wow. Because throughout his whole career down here, you know, he had, we, we, we in, interfaced. Yeah. I was, a, you know, again, yeah. a young engineer. He was the big boss. Yeah. But then in, into the 70s and 80s, of course, he came in as president of Rockwell. Okay. So then he was my boss. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, and I was a whole lot closer. And then we would, you know, talk every day just about on the phone with uh, over something. Oh, wow. He lived to be 84 years old, I yeah, think. Yeah, he, uh, uh, he lived in uh, Cosa Mesa in, uh, in California, and he, he would call and say, what's happening down there? And I'd tell him some little event that had gone on, you know, with the, the program. And then it would recall something in his mind, and his recall was absolutely fantastic. Hmm. He'd start talking about terminal board numbers and pins and, and wire colors, you know, that sort of wire level of detail. Talking about Rocco Patron the, yeah, over yeah, the Kennedy Space yeah, Center quite, launch complex. Quite a, yeah, he was an amazing uh, guy. And, and, and many say that he was the right person uh, oh, I, uh, to get us to the moon. Uh, I, I, uh, I think you'll find anybody that worked for him back in those days would agree that without his leadership down here, I mean, we had, we had 26,000 people here at KSC. 26,000 and uh, you know he was the guiding light basically that that kept us flying and, and on time and uh, and it's like being the boss you can't be friends with everybody no, he was you know, you he gotta... was he was a great leader he wasn't always popular with a with a lot of people but he was uh, he was the right man for that job that's for sure well that's neat that you had a, a relationship with him at Rockwell after Apollo and yep. and, and, and uh, the shuttle then you guys were doing the shuttle together on there uh, Let's uh, let's get to the shuttle there. I was talking about. I'm going to grab a shuttle over here. I was thinking about you. Tra uh, oh, I know. Before we leave Apollo, these hypergolics. Uh, uh, we were talked about this earlier here. I love pulling out some of our swag from our uh, eBay centers and stuff. And here's your friends, the Apollo 15 crew. This is the last uh, crew. Hall 15, we were celebrating in July, right. being mm -hmm. on, on the moon and so forth. And I'm going to stand up here for Marty to show. Uh, this has some neat things in it, little things that you may have been handed out as a, oh, yeah. uh, a press release thing. And I thought it would be cool for you to see your command module there with uh, that uh, Al Warden was piloting with the, uh, uh, the uh, Sim uh, Bay experiments there and, and cameras. And we lost Al uh, in March, and I know he was a friend of yours. But uh, you told me that you guys, he had a little beef with you. Yeah, we, we uh, used to well, argue. After the Apollo 15. Then. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things, the, uh, you know, after the, when the, when the command module re-entered, you know, the service module, this, this piece here, of course, would, would separate with the SPS engine, would separate, it on, you know, coming back in. And right. the command module had its own RCS system. You know, the service module, I told you about the four quads. Well, the right, command yeah, module we, had... Yeah, these, th so this separates here. Right. Uh, and I, I can't get that off Okay, but anyway, but there's 12 more engines on the, on the top. 12 on the, on the on cone. The command module okay, that, the command that module pro itself. provide the attitude control of the command module for re-entry. Mm -hmm. And when, that, when they've gone through re-entry and they're coming back in, uh, they start to dump the residual propellant out of these tanks gotcha. uh, so as to not have any sort of leakage or any, any residual fluids left for the, for the uh, guys that are recovering the command module. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, we dumped that propellant out. Well, on Apollo 15, somehow the chutes were released and we were still dumping oxidizer. Ah. And, uh, and the oxidizer actually burned through the risers on one of the chutes and they lost the chute. You know, very, very serious situation. They were down yeah. two, two chutes, and which it was designed to land on two chutes. It's, that you was know, like it could, you know, it just landed heavy. Yeah. But the uh, 
but, Ro but Rockwell at that time, or North American uh, Rockwell at the time, uh, did an extensive bunch of testing at White Sands to try and prove that it was not the oxidizer that burned through the chutes. Uh, it was hydrogen embrittlement of the D-ring of the, the lines that held the chute. And they, they set up all sorts of testing at White oh, Sands really? to prove <laughs> that. Well, I, I was explaining this to Al Warden. We were at dinner one night. And, and, and I was saying, no, you know, it wasn't the oxidizer, it was this hydrogen embrittlement. And he says, you're full of, you know what? He said, let me tell you something. He said, when you're laying there looking out the window watching the chutes turn red and burn, he said, you know it's not hydrogen <laughs> embrittlement. Oh, 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 really? So I finally, uh, finally agree with him that it was, huh. in fact, the oxidizer. So. Well, he was a heck of a guy, wasn't he? He was. He was a great guy. Yeah, uh, he really was. And uh, all astronauts are, are wonderful people and do a lot of outreach, but he particularly uh, touched the hearts of a lot of people and and uh, his frankness and so forth of, yep. of talking about uh, what was good and what was bad. So we miss Al Warden, and that's uh, but cool. That's 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 neat. There. Let me set that down there. Well, by way of the shuttle, uh, here is a look at this old. 1975, uh, uh, somewhere in there, of the of the, the concept of the shuttle as it was being sold. Where's this? There we are. There. Uh, this is uh, six or seven years before the shuttle was launched, and this is what Rockwell was sending out to tell people what we were going to do with this machine that was going to launch a couple times a month. Was how it was sold. Well, I figured, yeah, this was. But it didn't. It turned out to be a lot more difficult than that, and. Uh, uh, like I said, eight or nine times a year was the most that we ever launched it. I think eight was the most, yep. Uh, in there. But uh, so what did you do on the shuttle there? And I'm going to bring up this, uh, this uh, our, one of our special models here in the museum that you can buy this kit, I guess, to show you. Uh, you, you were involved with the RCS reaction control yeah, uh, system you know, on this too, right? On Apollo, uh, you know, I, I was the hyper guy, and I worked RCS and SPS, and then, of course, it was natural for me on the shuttle. I moved over to shuttle at the end of 72, at the end of the lunar program. Uh -huh. So I was in on the very early days of the design. In fact, when I started on the, uh, on the orbiter, we still had uh, wingtip RCS systems, and we had... Uh, oh, really? You had RCS systems yeah. on the wingtips, yeah. huh? And, proposed, uh, okay. Well, there was a, we had... Uh, Jets, jet engines that folded out of the payload bay for cross range and coming, you know, for coming back, uh, flying back as, so a, as an aircraft. Coming out of the payload bay yep. with some jet engines that mm -hmm. would make this not a glider landing. Right. But is that? No, right? not, I've not, never not seen for, a picture of that. I'm not, not for flight, not for the space flight aspect, but for landing. For, for uh, if you wanted to fly it back or, or extend the cross range. Oh, so there, there was a lot of on seven forty seven. Yep. Oh, okay. And we had, uh, there used to be a payload arm that used to run down the middle of the bay. And, uh, well, there was lots of, you know, it, it was changing continually back in those days. But, but anyway, my, my first responsibility were, the, were these two big pods on There's each side. There's a pen there, if you want. These yeah. pods here, and, yeah. and those are called what? Well, uh, they're called uh, OMS pods. Uh, OMS is Orbital Maneuvering System. Orbital Maneuvering System, the OMS pods are these two little two, bulges two, there. Two pods. And, and, and here's the engines there are... On the, either side of the big F1 engines. Yeah, the I engines, mean, not F1, the SSMEs. This the is the Ohms engine. RS25s. And the Ohms engines were used to us to assist ascent, get into orbit. Mm -hmm. and they were used for orbital changes in flight, and for reentry. That was the uh, those were the engines that uh, were fired to bring the vehicle back. And those in. were fueled hypergolic. And this was all the same propellants. It's very similar to Apollo. The uh, the two hypergolic propellants. And these black circles on each side of the pods, those mm -hmm. were the reaction There's, control engines. Yeah, show you can them see over them here. Yeah, yeah the, the, the oh, black this is, this is called the were This is called the RC, RCS package okay. back in here. So, uh, and at the front end, on the forward RCS here, there was another <coughs> bunch of reaction control engines, and, and between the front end and the back end gave you all the attitude control. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were, some of them were, were heavy thrusters, like an 800 pound thruster, and then they had little vernier thrusters for fine control for docking to the station or any, anything else. So tell us, give us, the, give us the, the Newtonian physics for those that don't understand in, in space what these do. Well, they just uh, provide the, uh, you know, the, basically they're the, they're the steering system for the vehicle. Well, the rea for every reaction, reaction there's an, an opposite and equal reaction. reaction. Yep. So these, these so. were just, uh, you know, 
So if, if you, if you blast button. a bunch of, of energy out of one of these, it'll move it in the opposite direction. Right. And what, how many were 40 of those around this vehicle or something like that? Oh, I think there were 38 primaries and six verniers. Okay. So a lot of engines. And the astronauts said you could hear them go off. They were like uh, cannons going off. Yeah. Yeah, they were, they were very noisy. Now, these are a lot bigger thrusters than Apollo. The Apollo, the, well, the little ones we looked at there, were 100-pound thrusters. Yeah, uh, here on the... Uh, yeah, they're, they're, these are 100-pound thrusters. These are 800-pound. Wow, 800-pound yep. thrusters. Because of the more mass involved. Well, yeah, you're moving a whole uh, lot bigger uh, vehicle uh, around. This is a 100-ton vehicle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, 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 so you really figured out all of that. There was never any issues with the hypergolics, it seemed. Uh, except safing them when they landed. Oh, we had a lot of issues. Oh, did you? Okay, oh, yeah. all right. We had the... Uh, well, you shouldn't have. You had it all figured out here, John. No, nah, we didn't figure it all out. <laughs> we didn't figure it all out. But the, uh, we had a, a, a big spill in 1981 on the, on the second vehicle uh, when, again, one of those complicated disconnects uh, stuck and, uh, and it flowed out the disconnect at a pretty good rate into the scupper, overflowed the scupper, and the vehicle was vertical at the pad, and then it ran down the side of the vehicle. Oh, my. And, Which uh, vehicle was that, you remember? Columbia. Orbiter? Columbia. Columbia. Yep. This was no, October 81, I think uh -huh. it was. Explain scupper. Sorry? Explain scupper. Oh, scupper. Yeah, a scupper is a, uh, basically a mechanical device that, that clamps around the disconnect panel on the vehicle to contain any spillage. Okay. Okay, and, and funnel it away. Well, it's four drips. And, and very minor spills. When you get a disconnect hanging open and you're pumping p propellant through it, uh -huh. uh, scupper is, just can't handle it. Wow. So it just overflowed the scupper and, 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 and all the tile downstream of that spill was starting to slide off the vehicle. Whoa. And they called me at home, again, it was I think one o'clock in the morning or some awful hour and said, we've got tile sliding off the vehicle. And uh, at that time I did not I was not responsible for the for this group. I had a design designee function, mm -hmm. but because of my background, they called me in, and, uh, and that was another turning point in my life. Because after that, I became a, the manager of that group, and then that set me up to to eventually become a director and, and move up into the chief engineer. But, so that was the yeah. We had some some bad hyper situations on uh, on the orbiter. Well, uh, what a career. What, what a career you had. I know you uh, were involved in both of the shuttle tragedies. You got uh, involved in the Challenger and the Columbia in there. And uh, in your oral history, you don't pull any punches there that these were probably things that could have been prevented. Uh, no question in my mind, yeah. Uh, uh, in there. And uh, uh, But what I did find interesting was... Uh, you thought, uh, when you did this oral history in 2011 that I read at, on uh, uh, Kennedy Space Center pages, um, you were saying that, that, of course, that was the end of the shuttle era there. And in 2011, you were saying that we probably should have turned this over to the private uh, go, uh, private businesses uh, in 2000 or, or earlier like that. And and we have, 20 years later, that's where, uh, you know, that's where we're at. <laughs> too late, too little. But you would have liked to have seen us keep one or two of those orbiters active, wouldn't you? Yeah, I think it was a, 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 a very poor decision not to maintain the capability to, to be able to launch U.S. astronauts to the station during that period, that nine-year period, right. basically. And, and I always felt that, you know, the, uh, the, the shuttle processing contract award to Lockheed back in 1984 was another bad decision. Uh, the, uh, the great partnership, and I use that term, that's what we used at that time of Rockwell, Martin, Thiokol, uh, mm -hmm. probably didn't do the best job in the world of, of bidding that contract and they lost it to Lockheed. Hmm. I think if they'd had won it, uh, we would have gone commercial uh, mm -hmm. within 10 years hmm. at that time. And I think that we would have still been flying at least one of the orbiters right through until now. Uh, but that wasn't to be. Well, they, they were and, just, uh, uh, you talked to people like Marty and you that worked on them, and it seemed like everyone was just getting in, in great step. The, well, uh, we, we, particularly we, Discovery we, was a, a favorite, uh, beautiful uh, we, we had a spaceship. good team. We had the right procedures. We had high morale. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, people were very proud of the vehicle. And, and you're not going to see another vehicle like this in, the li in your lifetime that could do what the, what the orbiter did. You know, the astronaut John Blaha talked out at the astronaut encounters, mm -hmm. and you know Mr. Blaha, I think. Yep. He said it'll be 100 years yep. before humanity sees another reusable spacecraft like this because of its complexities and, and uh, 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 the, you know, and management of the whole thing was, it was a beast yeah, too. Yeah, it's... Uh, but, uh, but it's mm -hmm. not that you can't do it, it's the unwillingness of somebody to take that on uh, again. Regretfully, it was, uh, it was a complicated vehicle. It was expensive uh, in terms of labor to turn it around, and, and, uh, and the Columbia loss was the final cap. Right. And, uh, and uh, when they came back out and said that basi it's basically an unsafe vehicle, I thought that was very unfair. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you couldn't have found a safer vehicle. You know, Cripp, uh, Bob Crippen would be the first to agree that it was a, he'd fly that vehicle any time. Huh. As far as he was concerned, it was, it was the safest vehicle you could, to do that sort of work. And he was coming back with less gripes than previous years. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and it was, uh, you know, it could take 50,000 pounds into orbit. It could bring 30,000 pounds back from orbit and right. land. That's it could carry experience. seven or eight astronauts at a time. Uh, you know, it, it, it had, f and it, it was reusable. And in just uh, 35 trips built this immense space, space station, station. That, yep. that's up there. Yep. So the future here, what, uh, you, you live here in Merritt Island. Uh, uh, Marty Winkle and I love bringing the launches to our viewers on Stay mm -hmm. Curious. And the other one, that other morning, uh, uh, if you weren't up for it, it probably rattled your windows. That, that, Surprisingly, that. it didn't. Uh, really? It was very quiet down. You know, we live about 17 miles south of the pads, uh -huh. and it was we didn't, it was quiet that night. But to, I think that you know what the most amazing thing today is. Yeah, you know, to, I, I mentioned that to, to yeah to lead into that. Have you met any of the big players today, like Elon Musk or? Jeff Bezos, no, I uh, or any of their no. technicians. No, I, I, I know some of the guys that work for, for SpaceX and for Blue mm -hmm. Origin, but... Uh, so what, what do you think about the climate today? I, I, it's exciting. I, I wish I was 40 years younger. I'd, I'd be back in the business. So All right. Think, you know, they have got some... You know, SpaceX, we say what you we will. We all wish we were 40 years younger. <laughs> 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 but, but no, I'm teasing you. You're, you don't look your age at all, well, sir. Well, thank you, thank you. But anyway, SpaceX is uh, it's setting a pace that is incredible. You know, I never thought I would walk out into my drive and watch a rocket come back and land. Yeah. Uh, pad 13 was where I activated Pad 13 in 1962. Oh, and that's their landing site. And that's their now. landing site now. And I thought, you know, can you ever imagine standing back there in 1962 and thinking wow. one, day, one day this big 200-foot rocket's going to come back here and land? And, and that and is just incredible. And two of them at one time and, uh, on uh, the heavy. Yeah, on the heavy. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's uh, amazing. But, you know, you've got SpaceX. I was just looking at a map the other day of... The, the northeast coast of the Cape, you know, from pad, starting at pad 39B, you have one, you've got 39B, 39A. You've now got 48, pad 48 mm -hmm. going in there. It's, they're building it today. Okay. And then uh, 41, 40, 37, 20, 16, 13, 11, and 36, and 46, all in a row, and they're all active. Yeah. You know, and, and 10 years ago, it was, everything was going down. All the pads were derelict, and, 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 you know, we've got relativity now on 16. We've got... Uh, and you know that because he's a docent out there and has been all these years going well, out I, there. Well, I, I, I work with, uh, with the guys out there still on, on the history side of things. I'm very mm. interested in the old... Uh, I love to go to pad 3 and stand where the V2 took off. If you stand on, 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 uh, on that same flame pattern on the pad on pad 3... Yeah. ...and look, look to the northwest... You see huge towers going up on 36. Yes. Which is the which is the New Glen launch site for Blue Origin. Mm -hmm. And that's just you know a few hundred yards away. I was out on Cape, uh, Cape Canaveral Beach over the weekend and hadn't been out there in a couple months and couldn't believe how how the gantries topped off now. Yeah, and uh, uh, for you know the you're, and, for the uh, first time in probably 50 years you're seeing stuff being built out there now and not being torn down, which is a real good feeling yeah. from a space buff. Yeah, yeah. But so, yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of interesting things coming down the pike. And uh, SLS, one of these days, it'll get here, you know, uh, whether it'll launch next year or, or 2022, I don't know. But, well, but the private businesses, is, is, they're, 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 they're not looking back. I mean, our yeah, government wants to put the Orion together and the SLS and go to the moon and Mars. What do you think about the Artemis program? 
I mean, is it feasible that uh, the, the, uh, we'll the, have boots the, uh, on the moon in four years? The and program is feasible. There's no technical challenge there. You know, it's 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 it, it can be. It, it, we've already established we can do just about everything they're talking about doing now. Is the nation prepared to back it? Are the are the politicians prepared to finance it? Uh, the timeline is probably uh, you know out of line right now. I don't think there's any way we're going to do it in, by 2024. But mm -hmm. uh, we certainly give it a good hack, you know, they're, they're working hard on it in all directions. But, uh, you know, we could well have a different political world next year mm -hmm. that says, hey, you know, we've got other way, other places to spend that money. And the whole thing, a pack of cards come tumbling Which down. Which is what happened at the end of the Apollo era, the, uh, to the shuttle, yep. and the shuttle yep. changed. And, yeah, it's kind of... Pol politics you just get the yeah. politics out of it and show what, what, uh, uh, what I mean... The bang for the buck, the American taxpayer, you and I know, the return of investment of how we're living lives today, is is a lot of it's rooted right in what you did, sir. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, in in the the Apollo and, and shuttle yep, programs. Yep. Uh, it's just amazing the technology and and uh, the benefits. Yep. Uh, uh, and uh, we don't want that to end. And uh, but as, as private business takes over, they're going to lead the way. Uh, probably much like the airline industry started maturing, you know, mm -hmm. in in the the 1920s and 30s, in there. So. Well, you know, Musk has got some some grandiose ideas. You know, yes, they do. They and, all uh, do. Well, it it has been a pleasure talking to John Tribe here on our Stay Curious program. Is there something that uh, I neglected to ask you, or something that you'd like to share with our friends out there? Oh, I don't think so. Not the top, top. I think I've shared enough already. <laughs> okay. Well, we're not going to get in trouble. Uh, uh, we didn't get him in any trouble no. there. Uh, I like, he's like Al Ward, and he's got strong opinions and not afraid to share them. And, and uh, uh, some of those opinions, you know, uh, do change uh, when they are heard down there. But uh, uh, it's been delightful having John Tripe here. Uh, you've been a wonderful supporter of our museum. We miss seeing you here. <laughs> We were, the last time John was here, there were, we had a bunch of, well, we had 30 uh, British students here. They were high school kids yep. and early college. And uh, one of the usual groups that we've had come in here from Europe and, and Japan and so forth in our museum. And you were here and you gave them a little pep talk and, and told them about, about what you did. And uh, that had to, and took some pictures with them. That, it yep. means a lot to them back there, doesn't it? Well, you know, it means a lot to, to me, too, if, if we can sow seeds in yeah. those young people to get into this business, you know, then, then it's, it makes it all worthwhile. It really well, does. That's what we've, you've done today, John Tribe, right. sow some good seeds mm -hmm. out there, told us some good stories. Marty, do we have anybody chime in with any questions today? Do you have a memorable flight, a memorable mission? Do you have a memorable mission, mission? or flight? <laughs> well... Another little story, uh, Apollo 16 was the, uh, we were... John Young, Charlie <laughs> Duke, and, and uh, 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 orbiting was um, Mattingly. Uh, yeah, Ken Mattingly. Ken Mattingly. Anyway, the, uh, we were doing the, fight, you know, the pre, pre-launch checkout out on the pad in the command module. And uh, again, I was at home in bed. It seemed like all these things happen when I'm home in bed, but the... Uh, they called me up to say, hey, you know, we've got a weird situation out here with, with the tanks. And they gave me some pressure data, and I said, well, that doesn't sound good. So I, I, I went out to work. And, uh, and I said, the only way we can look at this data is, I said, we've, we've busted a bladder in a command module tank. Ooh. Now, the, command, the, the propellant tanks in the command module are in the, what we call the, the pork chop area. Out in the area, Soda. right at the very base of the command module. The pork chop area. Yeah, that's the. Is that what if, you if, said? Yeah, if you look at a cross, <laughs> if you look at a cross section of that area inside that area right here, uh, outside of the pressure vessel, but inside the outer case, it had the shape of a pork chop. Oh really? Uh, cross section. So anyway, our tanks are down in that area, and uh, if that bladder had been ruptured, and the bladders were made of Teflon and they could not take, we had a 10 psi limit of delta pressure from one side to the other. And that night, again, a disconnect had acted up. Tech hadn't connected it properly. And we'd put pressure 200 PSI on one side and zero on the other. And the bladder had ruptured. And uh, what that meant was, uh, you know, it couldn't fly. That vehicle had to roll back from the pad. So here's the first 
case of having to roll a oh, whole 16. Saturn V stack back from the pad to the VAB. These stack the command service module, lunar module combination off in the VAB, roll all that back to the manned spacecraft building, wow. take all the components apart, take the command module off the service module, and take the heat shield off the bottom of the command module, oh. which we'd never done before down here, to wow. get to that tank and change out that tank. And we did all that in two weeks. But it was enough to slip the launch a month. And, and I think and the launch was in April 72. April, right. This, was, this happened at the end of January uh, 72. And, and they beat up on our group pretty royally. It really wasn't an engineer issue. But you've got, to look at, you've got to look at somebody to blame when this happens. And it was very embarrassing to Rockwell. So uh, they, wow. they took it out on us. It was the worst, it was the most memorable launch of my life. And it was probably one of the worst times of my life in terms of morale in the group and everything else. And yet, a few years ago, I'm talking to Charlie Duke at an event. The uh, astronaut that uh, walked uh, on the moon uh, with John Young. That was on Apollo 16. Mm -hmm. And he said, were you involved in that bladder incident? And I said, yeah. He said, well, let me shake you by the hand. He said, I had the measles. They were getting ready to jerk me off the crew. Oh. He said, you slipped the launch a month, and I got to walk on the moon. And he wow. reached over and shook my hand, and I said, well, there's a silver lining to everything. <laughs> but that, that, that was a right. very memorable launch for me. That's that cool. Well, what a great story to end our little conversation with you, John okay. Tribe. Uh, uh, always a delight to see this gentleman's smiling face come into any event we have at the American Space Museum or on the Space Coast for that matter. So <clears throat> maybe you'll be lucky to hear him talk someday. So, John, I appreciate you being here. Thank yeah, you for all you do. My pleasure. Mark, we, uh, you know, as an as outsider, I appreciate what you and Marty do on these. This is, this is really great to keep the, keep the museum going and keep an interest in space. I mean, there's a lot of work on your part. I, I, <coughs> well, thank I you, sir. It. It's not just us. It's uh, our whole staff here. But, yep. yeah, we do what we can. And <coughs> I uh, need a drink of water there I don't have. Yeah, I thought I was the one who was going to lose my voice. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> we're going to COVID up here with our masks. And we're going to thank uh, Clay, again, Clay Locke of Coastal Window and Tent here in Titusville for giving us this screen. It worked out pretty good here uh, as we have some other uh, interviews lined up with, with gentlemen like John Tribe. Uh, again, thank everybody for being here. Marty? Any birthdays or anything? Yeah. Marty, we don't have any birthdays today. Uh, we've, we've had one astronaut birthday all week, and I looked ahead to schedule, and, and, and we don't have a, even a, a, a manned space launch until the end of next week when GT5, Gemini Titan 5, go up mm -hmm. and spend eight days or bust. Uh, Pete Conrad and uh, the commander was uh, Gordo Cooper. So uh, Marty and I were talking about how, gosh, July was just so packed with, with Apollo, two Apollo landings mm -hmm. and ADSTP and uh, all kinds of stuff. And then we go in a place where we're like, what are we going to talk about? So we're just glad to get a hold of you and come in here and talk. Uh, but uh, we are glad for everybody out there that helps us, uh, watches these programs as we help you stay curious. I'm Mark Marquette with NASA legend, Brockwell engineer, John Tribe, and we will see you tomorrow and bridge the space between us.